So I think uh, organizations don't necessarily have to design for scale. I would say that uh, once you have a great product market fit and there is a great opportunity ahead of you, the size of the opportunity is massive and you need to capitalize on this opportunity, that's when you need to design for scale. This is episode number seven of Stars of Learning podcast with HR head of Big Basket, T.N. Hari. Welcome to the Stars of Learning podcast, where your host Jyoti Ji exposes the minds of the thought leaders who have vast experience and in-depth knowledge in the learning industry. Now, over to your host Jyoti Ji. Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to the Stars of Learning podcast and I'm your host Jyoti Ji. I'm glad and happy that you are joining me today as each episode of my show are sure to accelerate your learning, enhance your capability, connect with these inspiring leaders and keep you well versed with the disruption or change happening currently and in the future at the learning phase. I also assure you that you will master the best of what people have already figured out. So friends, before I jump into the episode, the great news is Stars of Learning podcast completes three months and what more, thousand plus downloads across 22 countries. And this was only possible through this podcast, friends. I must thank you and my heartfelt gratitude to you and to all my wonderful listeners who have been in this journey. And I'm super duper excited when you all reach out and connecting to me. So, so inspiring and motivating friends. And this wouldn't have been possible without you supporting me in this uh, journey. Thank you. Thank you once again. And if you are a first time listener and tuning into my show, please hit the button subscribe. And so you don't miss the future episode. And this is my seventh episode live on Stars of Learning podcast. I'm super excited for this show, guys, as our guest, Tian Hari, heads the HR at Big Basket. And he's an advisor and sounding board to numerous young entrepreneurs and startups. He's also a strategic advisor at Fundamentum, which is a homegrown growth phase uh, fund set up by Nandan Nilikani and Sanjeev Agarwal. He has studied at IIT and IAM and also worked at an executive level with multiple startups and has been through four successful exits in different industries that's Daksh, Virtusa, Amba Research and Taxi for sure. His passion is in scaling organization to clear thinking and relentless execution. He writes regularly on LinkedIn and LinkedIn has identified him as one of the top voice in India for three consecutive years in a row. He has co-authored three books. The last two books were Cut the Crap and Jargon, Lessons from the Startup Trenches, and also another book, Cutting the Guardian Knot, India's Quest for Prosperity. So friends, I had got an opportunity to meet Hari Tian at one of the conferences I attended last year and that's Human Connect uh, 2018 and his speech was around uh, how do you bring change in the organization and I really had a wonderful time going through his session and what's interesting is he made it so simpler on how to embrace change and the topic I heard him speak and that story what he brought in was so knit and you know so well connected for us to ponder on how to embrace change it was so simple friends and today's topic is designing organization for scale and i'm sure you will enjoy the conversation with real time insights what i'm going to hear from hari today so without any further delay let me welcome my guest tn hari who is extremely passionate about solving problems and building organization for scale through clear and uncluttered thinking and relentless execution. And that's uh, what our topic would also be involved. Hari, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jyoti. It's been a pleasure uh, to be on your show. 
Thanks, Hari. Uh, it's been an honor and it's great to be connected here and to get the insightful information on the topic design organization for scale. So, Hari, uh, before we jump into the depth of the topic, uh, would you give us your background and how you got to where you are today? Great. Uh, so, Jyoti, uh, I grew up in a small town uh, in Orissa. My father used to work for Hindustan Aeronautics. And uh, the school, my school was in the, I mean, run by the company itself. This was a very small township, about 7,000 in terms of population. So, essentially, I remain a small town boy. And uh, I had the fortune of uh, studying in a good uh, CBSC school in English medium. And uh, I was uh, interested in science. I pursued my interest to do uh, mechanical engineering from IIT Madras and then followed up with uh, an MBA from IIM Calcutta. I was uh, reasonably passionate about engineering. So the reason why I did an MBA was not to really get out of engineering, but to get a more holistic uh, perspective of a business. I started my career with Tata Steel, where I worked on the shop floor for about 11 years. Every day was almost being baptized by fire. You can imagine uh, yeah. the steel company, how it would operate. And uh, after about 14 years, uh, I enjoyed my days in engineering. But at some point of time, after 14 years, I figured out that uh, Tata Steel is not necessarily the place where I would like to make a more long-term career and my skills and competencies might be better suited in a different kind of an organization. The last two years at Tata Steel, I had done some work in HR. It was by accident that I moved into this field. The company was going through some dire situation. Uh, CIS countries after liberalization were dumping steel at uh, prices that were below our costs. And Tata Steel had to cope up. So we got in McKinsey to help us with uh, restructuring, uh, redefining the culture, changing the compensation and benefits plans, getting younger people into positions of importance. So I was part of the core team from Tata Steel that worked with McKinsey on this project. A large part of this project was really about uh, human capital. I enjoyed it and continued with this in the subsequent companies. The last 17 years for me has been with a string of startups. The first was Daksh. Daksh was acquired by IBM. Uh, then I worked for Vertuza. Vertuza was a mid-sized uh, US-based IT services company, which was more in the product space than in the services space, though it did services also. We listed this company on NASDAQ. And I moved on to a company called uh, Amba Research, which did investment research outsourcing for uh, international banks and international money managers. And uh, this was acquired by Moody's. I then moved to Taxi for sure, which was then acquired by uh, Ola. And then I'm with Big Basket. So for me, the last uh, 17 years have been exciting. It has been romance with uh, startups. Thoroughly enjoyed um, the overall culture at startup, the fast pace, the chaos, the uncertainty of it all. And this is the environment I seem to thrive in. So thriving in chaos is my core competence in some way. So that's where I am today. Oh, wow. I think that's an amazing career update and uh, thriving on chaos. Competency is a very unique skill, I would say. And that's a real great journey you have had, Hari. So, uh, Hari, uh, I always begin my episode with my first question to my guest on why. Why we need to design organization for a scale, which I think every CEO aspires for growth and expansion. But we are today talking about, you know, uh, to scaling. Right. So I think uh, organizations don't necessarily have to design for scale. I would say that uh, once you have a great product market fit and there is a great opportunity ahead of you, the size of the opportunity is massive and you need to capitalize on this opportunity, that's when you need to design for scale. And therefore, okay. the, the ability to you know capture this large opportunity will happen only if you design for scale. But if this opportunity is not there, the product market fit has not yet been established, then it does not make sense to design for scale. So clearly designing for scale is an outcome of great product market fit, terrific mm -hmm. opportunity, large opportunity, and customers will love you. And you need to capitalize on this, so you do need to design for scale. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So... Uh, so then today scaling a company is a necessary. That means uh, when we able to capture the opportunity or even the customers we want to understand to be in their shoes, uh, 
the change is definitely going to hit us harder, right? While we in parallel focus on growth and expansion also. So what must change to keep the organization from breaking? You know, as you you have witnessed uh, explosive growth in the kind of a companies you have uh, come up with, Virtues or a taxi for sure. What's your insight on the overall uh, uh, change? So I would say that uh, any organization, especially a startup that's uh, scaling, needs to deal with uh, two op- opposing forces. The first is an innovation component, which really comes with you know entrepreneurship. Uh, I would say that a startup is really based on innovation and ability to disrupt something and do something in a very different way. So innovation is one force. The second force is st- a stabilizing force. So these two are opposing forces. As an organization starts young, it needs much more of the innovation engine working and very little of the stabilizing you know, mechanisms. But as it grows bigger, as it begins to scale, you need to introduce those stabilizing mechanisms. Otherwise, the organization will come apart and break. Many startups have just come apart simply because they could not introduce at the right time these stabilizing mechanisms. A stabilizing mechanism, for instance, could be a prevention of sexual harassment policy and implementing it across the organization well. That's a mm-hmm. stabilizing mechanism. It ensures that you know, the workforce can work well together. Women are not, not harassed and it's a safe place to work. If that is not done, one single, you know, misdemeanor or one single incident can tear the organization apart. Complying with government regulation is a stabilizing mechanism. Mm. Are stabilizing mechanisms. Policies are stabilizing mechanisms. Sharing resources, you know, are stabilizing mechanisms across different parts of the organization. So as the organization grows, while it needs to be innovative, while it needs to continue to disrupt, it also needs to introduce these stabilizing mechanisms from time to time. So then the organization won't come apart or won't implode. Mm-hmm. Okay, very insightful, uh, uh, Hari. So, Hari, while we are talking about these two important forces, especially the innovation and the stabilizing uh, you know, mechanism in parallel, right? So this definitely calls for the organization to adapt a new structure to manage both the components together, right? So what would be your focus or a strategy uh, when you want to venture to scale up? Uh, The way I would see is that when when the opportunity size is huge, then the best way to scale is to create highly decentralized teams, select or pick people who can run these uh, different entities or business units independently, have a very supportive and lean corporate function, Corporate functions should be able to solve problems for the you know, different business units or different regions of the company. And these regions should be pretty much uh, like uh, independent entities where the region head or the business head is pretty much like a CEO, very well empowered. All the corporate functions must be replicated in the regions or in the business units. So in the growth phase, I would say do not try and uh, you know, optimize resources Do not try and necessarily share resources if sharing is not the best thing to do. Even if there is some duplication of resources across business units, that's okay. Because self-sufficiency is important for quick decision making and moving forward quickly. At some point of time when super growth or hyper growth is not such an imperative, then you can begin to create mechanisms by which resources get shared, no duplication happens, etc. Okay. Okay. So... So the, there are a lot of structure which you have uh, spoken, uh, Hari, about, you know, decentralizing or a lean corporate and enabling the team for, uh, you know, being an independent entity, or all of these. But then how do we enable the organization and also the people in the organization to be prepared and to manage? I mean, these all things... Uh, suddenly it can become a learning new ways of operating and behaving also as uh, that will you know stand a much better chance of making it in the long term uh, successfully right so how do we prepare the people to you know manage for such kind of a culture shift so that that's where really you know culture comes in Culture is something that creates uh, this, you know, 
where everyone knows certain basics. So once everyone knows certain basics, it becomes very easy to execute. And that's the reason why I would say creating a culture across the company is so important. If you don't create a culture, then you have to go through the basics every time. You have to decide what is right, what is wrong, what is the right way of doing things, what's the wrong way of doing things. How do we solve problems in a similar way? So I think creating the right kind of culture is important. And in a startup, culture really equals founders. As a startup begins to grow a bit bigger, I would say culture is really equivalent to the top 10 or 15 people in a company. And I would say if, even if a company becomes very large, culture is really determined by the top 10 to 15 people in the company. If they do the right things every day, if they walk the talk, if they demonstrate how to do things, if they demonstrate how to solve problems, if they demonstrate how to deal with conflict every day in the right way, then very quickly people under them would learn and people under them would learn. So the best way to you know, drive culture across the organization is by demonstration with the top 10, 15 people demonstrate it every day. And that's how culture in a company gets built. Once culture in a company gets built, it drives the right kind of behaviors and it drives the right kind of change. Yeah, very profound uh, information, uh, Hari. Uh, so you spo- spoke about, you know, uh, top 10 people or at, you know, top level executives. Is there a churn we need to see at the top level, especially, uh, you know, the senior leadership level in the process? As these business leaders must be able to think strategically and, you know, meticulously apply without disturbing the existing uh, scenario, right? Right. So I would say that uh, churn at the top level is uh, really should really be based on two things. One is performance. If somebody is not meeting performance standards, that person should be, you know, let go of. But it also depends on the culture of the company. Some companies are more surgical, which means that very clinical in their approach. If somebody is not performing, they will let that person go quickly. Some other companies would give a second chance. Some other companies may even give a third chance and allow this person to move out to a different role where there is a possibility, better possibility of this person performing. So it depends on, I think, uh, a couple of things, performance as well as the culture of the company. Some companies are very, very clinical. They let go if you don't meet your goals. And some companies tolerate um, average performance for much longer. True, true. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, Hari, prediction also becomes very difficult, right? Especially about the future. And as you say, leaders in the business, in the organization, uh, the performance and culture definitely matters. And you should also have such a mindset for thinking. How do you, uh, you know, instill thinking in the leaders in the journey of, you know, uh, scaling for entrepreneurs or the organization? The way to do this is, again, the same thing, uh, Jyoti, which is that uh, the way you teach how to deal with conflict, the way you teach, for example, what is ethical, what is not ethical in, in, a, in, in a company, the same way you teach thinking also. So if the top 10, 15 people know how to think correctly, can think strategically, can think very clearly, they will demonstrate that in every meeting themselves, whether they are conducting that meeting or they are part of that meeting. And by demonstrating that clear thinking every day, people begin to learn. Even people who are not so clear thinkers, will get it quickly, sooner or later. For example, if somebody does not think clearly is coming to a meeting, and if you are the manager, if you ask this person things like, why, why, keep on asking why, then this person would get to the root of an issue very quickly. Or next time when he or she comes to meet you, she will be prepared that my manager is going to ask me why, and I need to get to the root cause, so let me think about this a little deeper and then go for this meeting. So I would say ultimately it is a top 10, 15 people in a company which can drive across the company any kind of behavior, whether it is about dealing with conflict or thinking clearly or dealing with ethics. Hmm, Yeah, totally agree. If managers are able to bring in this flavor of why, why, why and enabling the whole team to go to the root cause, I think which in turn enables their thinking capability itself and that itself is a phenomenal shift, I would say. So, Hari, uh, in your experience, um, have you come across the very skills in, you know, execution of these uh, top management? Is there somewhere, you know, they are ill-equipped since their strategic thinking, 
um, may have got withered like it it is not optimistically used so ha- have you faced such kind of a challenge it's yes you do see this once in a while which is uh, yeah you do see this which is that sometimes people become very good at something which is like very good at, at execution but not necessarily good at thinking uh, big picture yeah. or thinking strategically and some other individuals are just you know armchair thinkers they can strategize but not necessarily execute i think uh, at the senior management level you need people who can do both one is not sufficient if you can just execute then you don't deserve a place at the cxo level you should be at a more junior level where you can just execute whereas at the cxo level you need to be able to be good at both you can't be an armchair thinker and not execute nor can you know how to execute but not think of the big picture so i think uh, at a cxo level at a senior level both of these are absolutely important okay okay and when you say execution um what does it involve what is the role people need to play in that uh, ladder right so i think you need to understand what is execution in fact uh, there is a book beautiful book uh, on execution i think written by uh, larry bossidy and ram charan uh, anyone uh, i would say who wants to understand execution should read that book so i think execution comprises multiple things you can have a simple process being executed day in and day out which is faultlessly de- delivering on a process which is for example delivering to a customer goods or products and services in a flawless way can be a process and that can be executed well whether something is executed well or not can, can be checked through an audit process an audit process actually reinforces execution execution can also be very complex so for example if you want to drive a change management program across the company and you need to execute that change then it involves changes in people's behaviors it involves political skills it involves people buying into what you're saying it involves people to agree that what changes you're suggesting are great there will be people who will oppose it there will be people who will oppose it quietly there will be those who oppose it openly there will be those who are going to resist it because they can't cope so you need to deal with these complexities so you can have very simple kinds of execution you can have very complex change management kinds of execution as well so as you climb up the ladder you need to deal with more and more complex ways of executing stuff across the organization okay okay uh, that's a wonderful insight and that book reference also would add value to my listeners hari thanks for that i'm sure uh, you know with these uh, such uh, ceo leaders involvement i'm sure there would have been a time you had to you know uh, roll up your sleeves and say no what was it like to you for you how did oh. you handle them because it involves people buying and you know uh, dealing with complexity political things lot of you know in the top management ladder how did you handle it you know saying no uh, saying no in what context i i didn't fully understand this jyoti i i'm asking you was there any experience you had got and you had to be firm in saying no because you know if you want to scale then this kind of an um, you know strategy will not work and we need to f- you know focus on another strategy yeah that is pretty common i would say saying no to something um to ensure that we scale in the right way uh, i think is fairly important i i would say that one of the core traits for working in a startup or being effective in a startup is assertiveness you can't get anything done without assertiveness you can't build a great product you can't create a great service you can't do anything without being assertive and assertiveness is not necessarily aggression assertiveness is being able to speak your mind without fear or favor and being able to say what you think is right being able to say what you feel so i think saying no many times uh, i have done that so that's pretty common in different situations okay okay sure sometimes uh, also you know when you we need to discuss at the top level we need to go with you know uh the facts and figures also right uh sometimes it gets brutal to talk about the numbers but then we need to face that can you tell us what kind of steps you took to ensure everybody is aligned you know at the beginning of it itself i've been part of the management team because you know you have worked with multiple startups and the uh, you know and you have scaled them and you also helped them to shape successful exits right in different industries can you 
uh, help us understand your experience in such a uh, you know board meeting talking about the numbers and getting them involved and getting them aligned at uh, you know same point of view i would say that uh, in some of the companies i've worked managing by facts and data has been a basic core value this was a core value at daksh managing by facts and data okay that uh, everyone in the management team needs to be aligned on this and this again is determined to a large extent by the kind of reviews that a ceo conducts so for example in, a, in the way a ceo conducts a review is all about facts and data if somebody says for example this happened because of this reason and uh, does not have data to substantiate that and the ceo asks what is the data to substantiate where is the data if this question is asked which is where is the data everybody you know data to meetings excepting you know god everybody else uh, brings data to meeting if you can make that very clear over a period of time i think people begin to understand that uh, facts and data is important and aligning everybody to the same kind of data is through goal setting there is a goal setting process where you know the ceo's goals are first set by the board and these goals are translated downwards you know cascaded down to different heads who report to the ceo so the ceo's goals are set by the board and after cascading it comes down again in numbers so ceo's goals can be it can be you know the harder numbers like revenue it can be profitability it can be customer satisfaction it can be employee engagement it can be about a few other metrics which then get translated downwards so everybody is aligned on these numbers okay that's an important insight uh, hari because you know uh, the data how we convert that into information and how we can look at you know a long term vision uh, definitely matters i think the way you have strategically mentioned about you know from the ce board deciding the ceo's goal to and cascading it down uh, i think f- for me and for my listeners this would be a great uh, input uh, you know on looking at the numbers as a focus point as we work on yes. so so hari uh, is there a biggest uh, failure or a mistake you have made along the way and maybe you, uh, you know uh, is there a learning which you would want to share it with us oh there are lots of mistakes and uh, failures i think uh, l- l- <laughs> list is too big so let me just give you one or two so sure. we were hiring uh, you know and one of my companies we wanted to hire a global head of sales we had a, a sales organization sales folks sales reps and the founders were also working with them to you know evangelize sales but we didn't have a global head of sales but as we were scaling we realized we needed somebody senior who had done big game hunting who could come in and set the sales process in order work with the sales force guide them coach them move move out the underperforming sales people recognize and push up the you know overperforming sales people set the sales incentives properly and after a great deal of search we identified one person he'd worked with large companies and uh, we did multiple interviews the founders did we did and finally in bangalore we were i was discussing this offer with him and uh, he spec- he was he was a us citizen he was supposed to be based in the us in our company because all our clients were in the us and europe and his questions were you know what uh, you you guys travel by coach can i travel business class because i'm used to it coach means economy because we were trying to to get profitable and we had decided that all of us would travel economy till we get you know reasonably st- okay will he be compensated can we have an exit clause for early termination all these were red flags but uh, none of us uh, you know saw these actually many of us saw these but then uh, so there's something uh, you know uh, called um, uh, i don't know how to call this it's uh, or collective consensus or rather false consensus all of us seem to think that we agree that this candidate is good but it's a false consensus because everybody is you know never nobody has brought up their misgivings because each one thought that uh, others seem to think he is a great candidate so why should i just bring up and be a spoil sport why should uh, you know do this why can't uh, i also go along or play along so false consensus got built we hired him and in the first 6 months we had to let him go we had to pay a huge severance fee so this was a hiring mistake we done i have seen multiple hiring mistakes there are several failures and there were several mistakes and the lesson learned was that in terms in a startup however important or however senior a person you are looking for however strategic this person may be in terms of thinking how much ever large scale this person may have managed in the past 
get someone who can be hands on get someone who can roll up his sleeves and still do the work get someone who has not forgotten how to do work and not just get others to do it yeah yeah i'm with you hari it's so important basics definitely have to be right and uh, hiring right resource definitely matters and i like the way you summarized you know on get the people who know how to do work while he or she may be smart at getting things done uh, incredible i would say yeah thanks for that uh, insight uh, hari i'm also a big fan of you know simon sinek and his golden circle and you know the concept on why is what i also practice in whatever the projects i'm working on but then uh, while well, i've been following you from last one and a half year we being connected on the linkedin and i also got an opportunity to look at your blog you know um which caught my attention so i thought i should definitely get your insight on this in one of your article you mentioned you learned how to handle three questions that haunt everyone it says so what why and what if in the process i think uh, you learn problem solving that's what right. you had mentioned and you also learn to handle uh, aggressive environment and you also developed internal customer orientation through this process can you explain to my listeners with one of the example how this method helps yeah this is um, i i found this very helpful which is that you know i've sat through thousands of presentations and in most of these presentations a lot of data is presented sometimes one slide has some 30 40 numbers and the title doesn't even even tell you what they are trying to say so my question on every slide who makes a present anyone who makes a presentation my advice to them is please have an answer to the question so what because if someone asks you looking at your slide so what which means that what are you trying to say from this what is the insight that you're trying to present what is the data saying if you don't know that very clearly don't have that slide because it's not just about the slide it's not just about the way you present data it demonstrates your clarity of thinking have you asked the right kind of questions have you looked for an insight or 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 are you just throwing numbers the so what thing helps people get clarity it helps people provide an insight and not just data and numbers or other things the why is about getting to a root cause which is most people sometimes don't get to the root cause they just present a symptom so if you ask why you know if you say for example the customer satisfaction has dropped okay so why customer satisfaction has dropped because there have been delayed deliveries why have the, there been delayed deliveries there have been delayed deliveries because we didn't have adequate manpower why didn't we have adequate manpower because the roastering system did not work why did the roastering system did not work because we didn't assume the right percentage of absenteeism so asking why 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 helps you to fix a problem at the root and not just the symptom and what if is about scenarios you know everything in life is not very black and white or clear so you need to sometimes have different scenarios how things will play out so what if is about that these are the three or four scenarios possible these are the risks of each of these scenarios and that's how you can take a decision so that's basically about these uh, three approaches jyoti okay wonderful i think that was a profound uh, example also uh, for my listeners to focus on so what why and what if so and uh, my moving on to my next question uh, hari we are actually living in a world of industry disruption right so what are the key things you know one should do to be more uh, part of the business strategy i think uh, business strategy is a very very you know hyped phrase i think mm-hmm. thing to do is think clearly i would say think clear thinking is an imp- very important clear thinking def- depends upon the level of an individual so for example at a very junior level being able to ask the right kind of questions is clear thing being able to evaluate two alternatives is clear thinking but at a senior level when you are the head of a function reimagining how the function could look is clear thinking taking it to the next level is clear thinking solving complex interfunctional problems is clear thinking for the ceo for example making the right kind of acquisitions is clear thinking whether to make an acquisition or grow you know organically is clear thinking so clear thinking depends upon different levels and i would say business strategy is a broad or big phrase which is really about clear thinking at a senior level okay okay 
So, uh, Hari, what is it like uh, to work at Big Basket for you as an HR leader? It's fun to work with Big Basket. I've been here for about four and a half years. And I would say you know, Big Basket uh, is a great uh, online retail company to work for. I would say the founders bring tremendous uh, domain knowledge, um, I would say unparalleled domain knowledge, uh, retail domain knowledge to the company. Uh, it's a reasonably, I would say, um, from from a you know environment perspective, I would say it's not a very aggressive environment. Uh, it's a very healthy, collaborative kind of environment. Sometimes being very collaborative could have a few downsides, but life comes in packages. So companies also come in packages. So we are a company where we will tolerate, uh, or we might, we will not fire somebody at the first sign of underperformance. We will give a chance, we will provide coaching, we will provide a different role and uh, we provide good work-life balance, we provide a safe uh, workplace for women, totally safe workplace and our women are not just very educated ones in corporate. We run warehouses, you know, where there are pick, uh, a warehouse could be in Pune, it could be in uh, Nasik, it could be in uh, Jalandhar, it could be in Lucknow, any place where we run a warehouse, there are pickers, working packers, women pickers, packers, and uh, they are people who come from backgrounds where they're used to being exploited, used to being harassed. But at Big Basket, we have ensured that every single woman knows her rights. The senior most person at the location meets her on day one and reads out her rights to her, assures her that she can come and meet him, provides the phone numbers of all internal com complaint committee members. So I would say Big Basket is a safe place to work for everyone. There is a fair amount of inclusiveness. Overall, I would say it's a good place to work, though there are downsides and they're overall, I would say net-net, much more positives than negatives. Okay, wonderful. I think you also spoke about, you know, the domain knowledge and the coaching and the, you know, uh, skill set. You are very close to the people. So what is your opinion on the trends in the industry with regard to, you know, talent development? Because if you want to grow or a scale, paying attention to talent development definitely matters. And this is something close to my heart because I I had the uh, you know talent uh, function at my organization, and this would be a greater insight to know from the leader like you. Talent development is I think extremely important. I would say that uh, talent gets developed in multiple ways. I am not in favor of you know using classroom training for talent development. I believe that uh, there is a model called seventy twenty ten model. I don't know where come from, but uh, irrespective of where it's come from, I think it makes a lot of sense, which is 70% of real talent development happens through very difficult assignments, being thrown in at the deep end and doing some difficult stuff, being given difficult goals to meet. 20% of learning happens through very insightful conversations. Those could be with peers, it could be with team members or even managers. I think just 10% happens through classrooms. So I would say you have to leverage the work environment to create these learning or talent development opportunities. So for example, if you're dealing, if you want to teach someone conflict management, and if you are going to attend a meeting with your peer of yours to discuss a subject where conflict is going to be involved, then take this person along with you, even if this person is not involved in that subject, just to sit there, watch you deal with conflict. That's a much better way of teaching conflict management than putting this person into one day classroom course on how to deal with conflict. So you can take this person along. You can use review mechanisms where difficult questions are asked. People are put on the spot, people are put on the mat and therefore they have to come prepared. So therefore this is a great opportunity for talent development. I would say nurturing insightful conversations is a great way to develop talent. And that's an art. How do you nurture conversations? How do you make every conversation insightful? How do you make every conversation a learning opportunity for both the parties? So I think managers have to learn this art. They have to learn to become coaches. They have to become magnets for talent. I think that's how you develop talent. Oh, that's wonderful and uh, much needed by the managers, I think, to showcase such talent in the organization. And uh, 70, 20, 10 model comes from the learning and development. And that's the strategy we look at, you know, improving workplace performance. And uh, what 70 is all about, the experiential, what we put in. And 20% is like, you know, when they go back, they apply it. And 10% is actually a formal method 
you know it could be a structured uh, you know connect which we do so that's the 70 20 10 model i think that's a profound information what you have shared uh, hari thank you so much for that and uh, hari since we spoke about the talent and the learning and uh, reskilling and continuous learning is something also very important to grow so what is your views and how is it working at uh, big basket yeah, relearning reskilling continuous learning i think is absolutely important it's getting more important every day because the life cycle of technology life cycle of many things is reducing the shelf life of everything is reducing so shelf life of a skill also is reducing so you need to constantly you know reskill and learn my own belief is that you know in a young country like india there are a lot of young people you know who are pushing upwards in any organization and until unless you can go continue to move upwards you will be pushed out of the company because younger people can do things you know at a much lower cost than you can unless you are relearning continuously so i think um, you are likely to get redundant after 45 years of age leave alone 50 unless you can relearn many people are going through this midlife crisis at 45 and some who managed up to 50 at 50 they're struggling Struck, you know what am i needed in this job is the company going to let me go because somebody who is much junior can do exactly what i'm doing and am i really needed so I think um, you have to take a lot of interest in learning. You have to be curious. You have to ask a lot of questions. You have to learn from people who are much junior to you. So you have to be a mentor, an advisor, and a manager. But at the same time, you have to also be an intern. So I would say in today's world, being an intern and a manager simultaneously is absolutely important. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Hari. Uh, I think now uh, it's uh, time for powerful questions uh, to unveil for my listeners. And uh, these questions have come up before even I launched the podcast. I was connecting with the thought leaders and asked them, you know, what kind of a key questions I should be asking other than the topic, uh, you know, I would be focusing on. And that's how these few of the questions have been framed. Are you excited? Yes. So, uh, in fact, uh, that's the mission of my uh, podcast too, which talks about, you know, engage, empower, and enlighten. So, my first powerful question to you, Hari, according to you, what is the star moment? For me, a star moment is when someone genuinely praises me. I mean, by genuinely, I mean without an ulterior motive. And uh, that person can be a team member, it could be a security guard, it could be the lady serving the tea, it could be my manager, it could be anybody. If they genuinely praise me for something that I've done well, I feel a star moment. Okay. So what inspires you to do everything that you do today? I think it is largely uh, two things. One is an inner desire to do something, to be make something of uh, impactful, as well as, uh, you know, when people recognize you, it makes you feel good. So I would say that I have not yet reached a stage where the inner desire only propels me. It's a combination of inner desire and recognition from others. Okay. So my next question is, if you have owned a company, what's one thing you would do differently in learning? I would force every manager to be a magnet for talent. I would force every manager to, you know, do talent development in a very good way, in a very uh, competent way, in a very practical way. Okay. Okay. And uh, what are the three most important things you would like to accomplish right now? I would say it would be uh, helping Big Baskets or seeing Big Basket through a successful exit, number one. Number two would be finding something really good to do, something where I can make an impact after I'm done and dusted with Big Basket. And last is, uh, I love meeting interesting people. So I would like to continue to meet interesting people. Sure. I think you were uh, really so humble to accept my request and giving all the details for my podcast. I was really wondering, will I be get, getting an opportunity? And you have been humble, uh, Hari. Thanks for that. Not at all, Jyoti. <laughs> Again, uh, this question uh, is based on my audience uh, request and they are keen to know the strengths of the thought leaders. So if I may ask you, what are your strengths? My biggest strength is I think clearly on any topic. 
and that topic can be about retail in big basket it could be about uh, you know how to solve the water problem of bangalore it's my ability to ask the right kind of questions that get to the core of an issue that's my biggest strength and that's that's the reason why a lot of founders or startups from different domains consult me they can be in the ai domain they can be in several other domains they consult me they want to talk to me because of my ability to ask the right kind of questions and get to the core of issues okay wonderful i think uh, then what's the best book you have read this year or any time you want to recommend to my listeners uh, i the best book maybe i've read this year it's not a new book but it's a little old not necessarily a very new book the book is by peter thiel uh that's titled 0 to 1 okay i found that extremely insightful for startups sure so hari i also see you saying that you know uh, the competence is something which we need to focus on what are the characteristics of the best boss or a role model or a mentor or a coach you ever had and what made that person great for you I think the best kind of a mentor or coach uh, for me is someone who makes me feel good about myself um com- believes in me trusts me helps me discover a pair of my own wings gives me the confidence that I can fly and uh, is affectionate and uh, provides me a dream and a vision and never ever micromanages me oh wow yeah Uh, so are there any tools that you use on a daily basis to be a better you i think these tools keep uh, changing with time jyoti i think um, these tools are not necessarily static or constant with time so to into at, at this point of time for example i use uh, forgiveness as a tool that means if somebody hurts me i forgive that person uh, if somebody is rude or uses the wrong kinds of words i forgive that person i, I don't carry a hurt so these are some uh, a tool this is a tool that i use today for example uh i don't carry any grudges for example this is a tool that i use today so i think these were tools that i did not use many years earlier so as you grow older your tools also keep getting refined so today i use some of these soft tools which to my in my mind are very powerful yeah wonderful i think uh, i also follow one of it gratitude of the day i mean right. sometimes we forget you know uh, the rain or a, you know good food being offered or somebody who help you uh, a cab driver who has been very courteous things like that so gratitude is what i am been following right right so in continuation are there any resources like a blog or a website you would want to recommend to my listeners often i don't have any specific blog or website that i can refer but i would say there are several interesting uh, individuals on linkedin who write insightful stuff i think every listener should figure out what her interests are and figure out who is writing on those interests and follow those blogs i would say okay sure hari we have come to an end of this interview and before that i have one more question left and before i ask you that question how can people get in touch with you to get more insight or collaborate where they can reach out to you they can reach out to me on linkedin they can send me an invite i usually accept okay on a closing note hari and that last question your advice to people who are new and want to accelerate their career in hr i would say if they want to accelerate their career nature they should uh, begin to understand business they should begin to understand uh, you know pnl balance sheets they should understand marketing they should understand finance so i think uh, unless hr people understand business they will never get a seat at the table they will always keep complaining you know that we don't get the seat at the table the way to get at the seat at the table the way to accelerate your career the way to get into the you know executive council of a company in hr is to understand business well is to understand the business implications of whatever you are doing in hr and speak in a language that business heads understand that's the way to accelerate your career i i really got goosebumps listening to your deep thoughtful advice hari uh, for hr professionals and the strong message which hit me is that uh, to get a seat at the management table we need to understand the business and speak in a language that business head can understand 
I think it's such a simple common sense technique uh, which we need to be mindful and focus on. Uh, definitely amazing uh, one, Hari. Uh, so all my lovely listeners, the links and the resources which we have discussed in this episode will be made available in my show notes page. I will list out all our conversation in my podcast description for your quick uh, reference. Thank you so much, Hari, for being on this show. I really enjoyed it. And my one key takeaway from the whole episode is, uh, you know, to have a clear thinking. Great. Uh, thanks, Jyoti. It was a pleasure being on this show. Pleasure being on your podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to have been connected. Thanks. Take care. So, friends, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And if you have got any learning or motivated hearing to this show, then make sure you share this podcast with your friends and post it on all social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Insta. And do tag us and let your friends know about this amazing information you have learned and let this piece of information help many others to engage, enlighten and empower. Thank you so much for your patience and tuning into this show. Bye for now. Take good care of yourself and go out and do something engaging, enlightening and empowering.